Hello and welcome to the EDM Podcast. This is episode 70 and I'm your host, Sam Matler. If you're new to the show, if this is the first time you're listening, the EDM Podcast is a show where I interview successful producers uh, and experts in the industry to learn about their story, to learn about their mistakes so that you don't have to make the same mistakes, but also to get advice from them, also to get their opinions on things. Now, today's interview or today's episode is with Matt Lang. If you haven't heard of Matt Lang, he's simply a genius. Uh, He went to Berklee School of Music and graduated. He also worked with BT for a year. And since then, he's done a ton of work, a lot of releases on Anjuna Deep uh, and other labels and some work with Mousetrap as well. We talk in this interview about that. We talk about his journey um, going to Berkeley, what that was like, what he learned, uh, how humbling it was, what it was like working with BT. Intense is the way he describes it. We talk about why he just makes what he wants to make and he doesn't really think about what's going to be marketable or what is going to make him popular. We also talk about his approach to writing music, uh, his thoughts on creative block. And his schedule, how much time he puts into music, what his days look like. Uh, And we also dive into some other stuff, some more technical stuff, uh, like mixing music in Dolby Atmos, which to me sounds very, very fascinating, but also terrifying. Now, one more thing that I just want to mention uh, before we get into it. We just published a new article on the blog called How to Build Your Network as an Artist. A lot of artists I've found don't know how to network. They spam their SoundCloud link or Spotify or whatever, but they don't really know how to do it. They don't know how to build connections well. They don't have any strategy or tactics. So this post is about 4,000 words. It is long, uh, but it will give you a lot of details and more of a plan for how to network, for how to build those connections, those friendships with people in the industry. So you can go check that out. Just head over to edmprod.com forward slash blog and scroll down a bit otherwise you can search it on the website if you're listening to this like two years from now also if you want the full show notes for this episode and this includes my takeaways my thoughts uh, and just some written tips and and just some of the tips from this episode in text format head over to edmprod.com forward slash 70 that is edmprod.com forward slash 70 we try to post each episode especially the good ones, as a blog post with takeaways, with a little bit more detail, with some other links uh, so that you can get more out of the conversation. So head over there if you're interested in that. And without further ado, here is Matt Lang. Enjoy the interview. This episode is brought to you by EDM Foundations. EDM Foundations is my course for new producers, those who've been producing for under 12 months or even those who've just started. The whole idea of the EDM Foundations course is that you learn the fundamentals of music production by actually doing and not just learning the theoretical stuff. The course consists of over 12 hours worth of streamable video where I walk you through the creation of three songs and give you advice and tips for working on your own original alongside them. We've had over 500 people sign up for this course. Many of them have had great results. If you want to learn more about the course, head over to edmfoundations.com. Welcome back to the EDM podcast today. I'm joined by Matt Lang. Matt, how's it going? I'm good. Thanks for having me. Of course, man. I came across your work a long time ago, uh, many years ago. I think it was a remix you did for, what song was it? Counting the Point? Oh yeah, Andrew Bayer. Yeah. Yeah. And and I'd never heard anything like it up until that point. And I fell in love with it and I've been following you ever since. So it's great to have you on the show. Uh, It's great to be chatting with you. Uh, Now, a lot of people listening to this will know who you are. I posted in the Facebook group and people were stoked that you're coming on. But for those who don't know you or for those who don't know you that well, tell us about your background. How did you get into music? What's the journey been like so far? Um, Well, it's pretty much been my entire life. So my parents had me at a piano when I was five, something like that. And I played other instruments when I was in school. And then I sung in a boy choir for about 
seven years or so. And when my voice changed, then I picked up the electric guitar then uh, played in bands, did that whole thing. And then finally, after all of that, that actually ended up taking me to Berklee College of Music. And I majored in basically music production and sound design. What was that like? It was uh, humbling and amazing. Um, you're just in this community. Why? Why? Why was it humbling? Because everybody there is pretty much the best from their hometown. Mm. And you're not so good anymore when, you know, relatively compared to, I mean, the quality of musicians are there. It's you have people who, you know, are pretty good. And then you have straight up prodigies. And it's really uh, it's amazing. It's the ultimate ego killer as far as, you know, thinking you're good at an instrument. That's what I've heard. And I've heard it's like a very intense environment. Yeah, it is. Um, But it was a great environment. Uh, I met, Mm. you know, my best friend still to this day at Berkeley. So I actually did graduate, which is pretty rare for Berkeley. And from there, um, I got pretty much within a month after graduating, I got hired by BT and I moved down to Washington, D.C. and worked with him for a year. Did the These Hopeful Machines album as well as a, a Pixar movie and a video game and a couple other little projects. I want, I need to stop you there. I, I know you can't talk about all of it, but what was that like? Because BT obviously in the production world is, is idolized. Uh, he's considered one of the best. What was it like working with him? Intense. Um, it was a lot of responsibility and I was 21 years old. I was fresh out of school. I had never worked in the professional environment in music at all. And it was very much sink or swim immediately. And so I learned, I learned a lot very quickly and it was everything from how to talk to record executives and managers and, you know, spending time with booking agents and, you know, everything on that side, but also, um, almost psychologically how to interface with people like that, how to talk to other artists. I mean, especially like considering BT himself is an artist and he's got all the crazy that we all have and he's not any different. So it was, um, it was a very big learning experience and uh, it's one I'm grateful for. You know, it was really hard. It was, it was really hard on me and that's really why I only did it for a year, but I wouldn't be doing what I'm doing now had I not gone through that. So for that, I'll always be pretty grateful for that opportunity. What were some of the key takeaways from that year? Like a couple of lessons that you learned. A lot of it would be aside from just production stuff, which isn't, I mean, I guess it's interesting in the context of this podcast, but um, aside from that, it was really um, the strongest takeaway was how to treat people professionally and personally. And, and how do you do that? With kindness. Of course, you know, when you're in a professional environment, you know, there is an element of having to be firm and almost producing in the sense of trying to get the best out of each person you're working with and knowing what people's strengths are, what their weaknesses are, and, you know, not pushing them in the wrong direction. But on top of it, just um, who do you want to be as a person in a way? And um, in that world, you're surrounded by a lot of big egos, of course, because, you know, it's a lot of famous artists tend to carry that around with them. And uh, it was a window in what I didn't want my life to become. Why do you think, uh, I've thought about this a bit and I've talked about it with some people. Why do you think famous artists tend to have an ego? Well, you have, (laughs) I mean, you have thousands to millions of people telling you how amazing you are. You know, if you're told something enough times, eventually you believe it. Yeah. I don't know how, I don't know what that would be like. Like that must just mess with you mentally. Uh, Oh my God. Yeah. I think it's, uh, I've seen it do really awful things to a lot of people. So I try to yeah. stay pretty far away from it or, you know, at least, I mean, we all have an ego, you know, that's, you know, especially when you're creating and yeah, we're all looking for validation in some kind when we release music and when we write it, but keeping it in check is definitely something I really tried to focus on as I've gotten older and that even like led me to like getting into like stoicism and things like that. Talk about that a little bit. I'm, I love stoicism. Uh, I think it's really important uh, because I mean, yeah, you're not, you're not like Beyonce famous, but you are respected 
and you are obviously skilled. How have you kept your ego in check or tried to? I mean, I have my moments. Don't get me wrong. And you can ask any of my friends and <laughs> you know, they'll, uh, you know, it happens. But I think it's just uh, self-awareness, you know? I think it, it's really healthy just to be cognizant of the way you're portraying yourself and what you're putting out there and understanding why you're putting the things out you say and, or you're putting the things out into the world that you say, like what's the reasoning behind that. And I think, you know, being pretty self analytical is a really great way to not only keep it in check, but, uh, always, always at least attempt to understand your actions and your words. I like that. Uh, going back to the stoicism thing, a lot of people won't even know what that is. Um, they, they wouldn't have heard the word. Could you give a quick explanation of what stoicism is and why it's important, especially as an artist? Stoicism, in a way, is almost a set of rules for living life, understanding that the world is going to revolve and exist and it has nothing to do with you. All you have, essentially, is you know the choices you make and the reactions you have to the outside world. And I think the really healthy thing about stoicism is it removes you from the equation and it makes you realize that no matter what, all you're only in control of yourself and you can't take anything personally because chances are people are just looking out for themselves as well. It has nothing to do with you. And I think reading like Marcus Aurelius or Seneca, that has been, um, that's been pretty healthy as far as uh, it's all, you know, just like theory of repetition, just uh, reminding, reminding yourself that uh, a, you're not alone, you know, but also that it's not about you. There's a much bigger picture at play and you can just essentially try to exist the best way, the best way that you can in your own mind, whatever, whatever that is. And I think stoicism is just a great roadmap or uh textbook in a way of um how to look at the world i like that meditations was a very influential book for me uh, as, as well as as well as letters from a stoic and also i like ryan holiday's work which kind of ryan's work is what got me into it actually him and tim Ferriss. interesting yeah yeah oh okay i really like ryan holiday you've read obstacle is the way i've read all of them nice nice yeah um, I would recommend people start with that, like yeah. listening to this. Obstacle is a way, great book. Uh, and then from there, you can go into the, the older stuff. After you do Obstacle, you have to do Ego is the Enemy. Oh, that is a fantastic book. It's brilliant. Yeah. Oh my, that hit me like a ton of bricks. I was me reading too, that and I was like, I'm just so arrogant. I know, right? No, I just- <laughs> <laughs> but I love that. You know, I, I think you don't yeah. realize... It's that whole thing about self-awareness and, you know, just recognizing your actions and why you do the things you do. And yeah. those books certainly, uh, they have the potential to open your eyes up if you're willing to let them. Absolutely. The one thing that hit me about that book was talking about uh, the fact that expertise doesn't necessarily transfer across domains. Yeah. Uh, which, cause I, when I was younger, not that long ago, actually, I used to think, oh, you know, I've built a successful business and then I could easily go and do this in a completely different industry and field. Like that's what I thought. No. And then I, I read that story about, I think it was a, an army general who did really well and then failed in every other thing that yep. he did yep. after that. And I was sure. like, wow, I, maybe I can't do that. <laughs> I mean, you never know until you try and you kind of owe it yourself to try. That is true. That yeah. is true. Um, anyway, so... So you work with BT for a year. What happens after that? So I, I quit that job and I moved back home. And basically in that time, I, uh, I actually met Andrew Bayer when I was living down in D.C. And he was living in D.C. at the time. And we both we both actually went to Berkeley, but I was two years ahead of him. So I actually never knew him in school. But we went out to a show, uh, BT and I, and it was uh, Above and Beyond. And when we were there... Um, we were both in the back room and Andrew was there too. And Brian was talking to, you know, people he knew and Andrew and I are just kind of both quiet and awkward. Like, uh, 
what's up, dude? <laughs> like we didn't know each other were or anything like that. And started talking and it was like, holy shit, like you're in my major at the school. I just graduated, you know, four months ago. You know, my girlfriend at the time, because my girlfriend back then, like she was still working at Berkeley when I was um, when I was down in D.C. So it was like these worlds just collided. So we became really close friends when I was down there and I used to spend a lot of weekends um, down at his place because I lived about 45 minutes outside the city at the time. So after I left the job with Brian, um, I, of course, you know, I had this relationship with Anjuna through Andrew. And so I'm back at my parents' place, like just trying to figure out what the hell I'm going to do with the next part of my life. And I just started making some club records because I'd done so much of that working with BT that it just seemed like a pretty natural direction at the time. And basically the first club record I ever finished on my own, it got played on their radio show. And that just, it just kept going from there as far as like that stage. And that was, you know, it's because I had a relationship with Andrew and ultimately that turned into a relationship with the above and beyond guys too, because I was really into gear and, you know, the tech side of things. So they would Skype me sometimes if they were having problems with their, uh, I guess, what was it? Yeah. The Apogee 80 16s and, um, DA 16s. Cause that's what we used to have at Brian's studio. So, um, I got to go, I got to know those guys in a different way than just an artist because it was also like in a way like a gear obsession kind of thing. And that led to releasing records with them for about five years. Then that eventually just evolved. I was the way my music was going was one direction and what they were doing was uh, they were going in a different direction. Do you mean you mean Anjuna Beats as a label? Uh, Anjuna Deep, but yeah. Um, yeah, I was always on the deep side. But so I decided, you know what? I'm going to I'm just going to start. I had a couple of these records. It was called like There She Goes and the other was Falling Into Place. And I just say, you know, I'm just going to put it at myself. I just. I don't want to deal with a label right now. And I can't seem to find a label that would actually want to sign them either because especially dance music labels, they can be really picky and it needs to fit their exact sound. And I don't really do that. You know, that's, I've never fit into that kind of box. So I said, I was going to do it myself. And it's funny. I think two weeks after um, I had sent, I had uploaded the masters of that EP to, and set the release date and everything. Then the a and Mousetrap, um, actually no, not even, it wasn't a and uh, About six months prior, the a and from Mousetrap had uh, requested from my manager at the time that, you know, if I had some records to send them over. And I sent them over and we never heard anything for six months. But two weeks after I uploaded the There She Goes EP into the label work system, then uh, suddenly Dead Mouse started writing on Twitter about Scorched Earth Policy. And mm. it was like, oh, well, didn't see that coming, but okay. And that turned into, of course, they released that. And then pretty much almost all of the dance music I've released in the past three years has been through Mousetrap. And then I'm still doing that, and at least when I do, you know, the clubbier things. And then I started doing a lot more of um, the electronic rock, like Nine Inch Nails, Perfect Circle, hybrid kind of thing. Mm. Um, I touched on my, uh, my album ephemera and the one after that patchwork, they both had glimpses of that. Both of them had two songs that, you know, were more, uh, rock influenced or down tempo, certainly not club, but they were, they were vocal, you know? And, um, and that's like, that's what feels the most natural to me. Like that is my bliss as far as, you know, when I'm creating music, it's that style. So I started um, doing a lot more of that and it was, you know, this is going to be my next album and I'm going to put out this album myself because it's, I I just don't want to deal with the label. I don't want anyone telling me how to write this kind of stuff. This is just going to be me. So then a lot of the, really the last part of this year has been working on stuff like that. And the first EP, I mean, the idea is basically it's uh, the EPs are going to come out first and then the EPs ultimately will become part of the album and the album will do, you know, vinyl and a whole actual release. So, um, the first EP of that, which was the punish me EP that came out in April and I'm basically two out of the two out of three tracks done now with the next one. And I hope that'll come out in November. 
And that's basically, um, that's where I'm at right now. What a journey. It sounds like you just make what you want. Do you not have, how do I explain this? Like a lot of artists find it hard to figure out the balance between making original musical music that they like and music that has viability in the market. Is that something that you ever think about or it just doesn't concern you? No, I don't really care about it. Why? Because if I'm doing something I don't like, I'll just hate myself for it. I've done that. You know, I've played that game before and uh, not so much with my own music, but, you know, I've produced other people, not like ghost produced, but like I've, you know, produced records. I've worked on pop records and all sorts of other kind of things like that. And um, and in that context, yeah, what you take into account is a lot more than just, you know, your own your own passion for what you're doing. You know, there is a certain necessity for it to be accessible. And, and I just don't like doing it. I really don't. And I've gotten to a point in my career where I don't have to. So why would I, you know, I like, I'd probably make more money. Sure. If, you know, I thought more about, you know, would this be a club hit or anything like that? Yeah. But what's that going to do for you? Honestly, I don't give a fuck. I really don't (laughs) like, you know, I'd rather just like sit in my little studio box and, you know, make the music I want to hear, hang out with my cats, you know, have a life and be happy with my life. And the only way I can really do that is by creating and expressing what I personally want to. And I don't think that's selfish. I mean, I've, <laughs> I've had ex-girlfriends who've like, you know, totally tried to tear me apart because, you know, why can't you do something that, you know, I like or something? It's like, it's like, it's not about you. You know, this is just like, <laughs> this is what I do. You know, I create, you know, and like it's, it's my job as an artist almost in a way, but it's also just, this is what I love. This is what makes me feel the best. I love that. I think that's, that's underrated as well. Like there's this whole, the thing you do now is you need to tour the world and you need to do it big and you need to have a hit on Spotify. That's what it is. And it's just, it's not going to make, it's going to make maybe 5% of people, 5, 10% of people happy. Most people don't like it. No, it's like, I mean, and I just, you know, I just, I'm back now finally after, you know, basically two months of being on the road every weekend and that's hard. It's really hard um, because you're just burnt out all the time and you're tired and yeah, don't get me wrong. It's great to travel around and meet people and playing shows is fun, but you know, it's, you don't eat well, you don't get to exercise and you're isolated. Cause I mean, I travel by myself, yeah. you know, it's not like I have a tour manager or, you know, a, a crew, anything like that. I'm on my own. So it's, if I'm doing, you know, the long weekend hauls, it's three to four days every week of basically being completely by myself in mostly airports, hotel rooms and airplanes. And it gets to you, man. It really like, it starts to eat you up from the inside and then you get home and you have really, you know, three days maybe, but then you have all this other life stuff you have to take care of, you know, like you have to catch up on everything, catch up on everything. So maybe I have, you know, one day for myself when I'm doing the touring cycle and I can't just, you know, then get right back into the music I was working on in one day. But I mean, I need momentum. I need to be able to like, live and breathe a song like and do nothing else but that for five days straight or whatever and i can't do that when i'm on the road um it's just you know not mentally i can't do it so it's uh i'm really glad to be back now so i can actually get back to you know the thing that i love the most which is just the pure creation for sure what uh, what does your schedule look like i mean do you have strictly defined hours do you strive to put in a certain amount of time every day or every week or do you just work, work, work. I have routines. I don't have set hours by any means, but I I try to get up at about 830, which is pretty respectable or pretty responsible for an artist, I feel. But I try to get to bed or wake up at around 830. And then something I started doing uh, almost a year ago is the first thing I do once I have my cup of coffee is I read for half an hour. And And it's great. It just, um, mentally, like I feel more centered and, you know, you get a lot of, you know, inspiration out of that. Yeah. I do that as well. What, what do you read? Uh, right now I'm reading Henry Miller, Tropic of Cancer. Never heard of it. Um, 
it's it was written in the 1930s that basically chronicle or yeah it chronicles a an american writer in paris and it's um it's pretty sexually graphic i was recommended it by a friend because um i went back and i reread bukowski's women and when i was in college bukowski was one of my favorite authors and i figured you know what i should like it'll be interesting because like now i'm 31 you know and i read it when i was 20 so and I've, you know, my life has had significantly more women in it now that I'm 31 than when I was 21. So I figured, you know what? I should reread this. This like, this will be interesting to see how my perception of that book changes. And, um, and of course I related to it now in a completely different way than I did when I was 21. But when I was 21, I was excited because I was like, oh my God, look at all the, you know, <laughs> he gets to sleep with all these women or, you know, it sounds amazing or whatever. And like 10 years later, you know, now that, you know, I've, I'm a bit older and I've had experiences. It's, it was a different perception of that book. Um, absolutely. And I liked it, but it was definitely in a different way. It was no longer the excitement of like, look at his actions. It was the way relationships were displayed and the faults of both people. Um, it was really, so con- I really enjoyed it. So consequently, a friend of mine recommended I should read Tropic of Cancer after. So that's what I'm doing right now. So you read and then get into the studio yeah yeah basically then i'll you know i'll i'll read and then i'll you know do the email stuff or whatever i'm just doing the emails on my laptop but then yeah usually i'm i'm in the studio around 10 a.m and the studio is in my house so i don't have to go far you know i just go upstairs but um yeah i'm i'm opening pro tools at about 10 and that's basically like the start of the day you know i'll take a break um a few hours later and go exercise or, you know, lunch, whatever. And then I'll come back and then I'll work until basically until it's time to cook dinner or if I'm meeting friends or something, you know, do that. But, uh, I would say on average, it's usually like a pretty solid seven hours per day. And then some days it's more, some days it's less. It's, you know, whatever's on the docket. And this is just your own work. You're not doing like client work or anything anymore. No, I don't do any of that really anymore. Nice. Nice. Yeah. Cause someone asked that question. They were going to ask how you balance client work with your own productions, but yeah, um, I don't, it's, um, I used to, I used to a lot and now client work to me is doing a remix and that's about as client work as I get. This is a good segue to go into the production side of things. Sure. Is there a difference uh, when you're producing a remix compared to an original? Is there a difference in how you approach it at all? Yes and no. A remix is easier because you don't necessarily have to create the hook or create the thing that inspires you immediately. It's usually there are things that are already there. But as far as the production side of it goes, it's like doing my own track. The only difference is that, you know, now I have someone else's vocal or, you know, a guitar or something like that. Mm. But, um, as far as, you know, when I'm actually doing the whole thing, no, it, it just becomes a, a me track entirely. You sit down to start a new project, original yeah. song. How do you, how do you approach it? What does your workflow look like? It varies. Um, some, it, it depends if I already have in my head what I want to do. If I'm kind of just needling to, you know, needing to fiddle around and find something, then, uh, it's, I might sit down at a Rhodes or, you know, pick up a guitar. I mean, I'm a, I'm a guitarist, you know, by nature, like that's, that's my instrument. And in that case, I might come up with something I like there. Sometimes I'll turn over to the modular synth because that is, you know, it's an unbelievably different idea maker and incredibly inspiring in a different format. And other times, you know, maybe it's a melody I have in my head or I'm singing or whatever, you know, it's all, I like having a lot of toys around basically because I don't, I don't do good or I don't do well with computers. I just don't find any inspiration and I need to, I'm a player, you know, I'm, I'm a performer. I need to actually have something that I can touch and bend and tweak. So it could be a synth. I like, I have a kind of a lot of guitar pedals now <laughs> and uh, and that based i mean that's a relatively new obsession in i think the past really the past year yeah and uh and now i have two pedal boards just totally full 
Wow. But I, I love that stuff. Well, I got into it because they were like half the price of modular synth modules, you know? <laughs> it was like, oh my God, I can have twice as many. Um, <laughs> so I got really into like fuzz pedals and uh, analog delays and stuff like that. So I just, I just like having things outside the box that I can touch and I like they it sounds better to me I just maybe you know it's like an emotional reaction to it because I can physically feel the amount of fuzz when I'm you know adding you know twisting the fuzz knob or whatever on like a dwarf craft pedal or something like that mm. but um yeah I just I have to be hands-on that's how I feel it I think that's been my issue for a while as well like you get I guess kind of stale just working in the box and like yeah clicking things and and i miss playing guitar i miss playing yeah. drums it's the best what are your thoughts on creative block the reason i ask it in that way is because i don't really think it exists personally yeah. some people do sure. um but what are your thoughts on it do you get it how do you deal with it yeah i think so i mean it's i think it definitely exists mm. i think there are ways to navigate it i don't think I mean, some people, there are definitely two camps on this and some people are, you know, my camp is kind of, you know, you do the work and you push through and eventually you find, if you don't find what you're looking for, you find something else that might be better. But then there's the other camp that is, if it's not working, I'm just not going to do it and I'm going to leave and I'm going to go mess around all day. And then I'm going to wait for creativity to strike. And both processes are valid because ultimately they both end up working. I think... For the way I work, I'd much rather just sit down and physically do the work because I think there's a lot more discovery involved in that and I feel more accomplished. Yeah. And if I just yeah. blow off the day and decide to, you know, it's not where I'm not feeling it right now. I'm just going to go watch movies all day or something like that. I'm going to feel pretty awful about myself at the end of the day. <laughs> so, um, no, but I find if if I'm working on a project and you know, I'm having a hard time with it or I can't see the forest for the trees or anything like that, then I'll just try to work on something else and, or maybe try new ideas, you know, start playing things on an instrument or, I mean, I just had a little silly epiphany two days ago where I just, I was working on this track that it's been really challenging because it's a, it's a challenging track. And just, you know, for fun, just some Pro Tools pulled up, you know, Audio Suite Reverse and just reversed an entire section just to hear it, you know? And it was one of those like, oh, that's it. That is, you know, this is the ending of the song. <laughs> like, this is the outro. And then, you know, it's taking, you know, the, like, I didn't want everything reversed, but, you know, like taking like the guitars and the pianos and like stuff like that, like, which sounded so beautiful reversed. And then, then recontextualizing that with, you know, new things that weren't reversed on top of that. And mm. that gave me a great idea, but, um, yeah, it's just, I don't know, trying new things, getting out of your comfort zone, trying things you wouldn't think of going outside for a walk is, you know, amazing. Like just walking to the coffee shop or whatever, just to clear your head, you know, stuff like that. But no, I think I just try to work through it. It's as simple mm. as that. Yeah. I like, I like that. Um, okay. I've got a few more questions. Apparently you do work with Dolby Atmos, like mixing songs. Is that true? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. What's that like? I mean, that sounds super oh, complex. It's a trip. Um, <laughs> <laughs> it's amazing. So backtrack a decade, my senior thesis when I was at Berkeley was I wrote a 15 minute long piece in 5.1 surround. And so I was really into surround sound. And I, at the time, like I bought this, pretty crappy little M audio surround system. So I could have it in my bedroom apartment, you know, bedroom studio in the apartment, but I got so into writing and surround. And then as far as music goes, five, one basically went the way of the Dodo. So I didn't really get to work in surround very much after that. And then getting involved with Dolby and basically having the opportunity to remix so much of my own existing material into Atmos, which is, it, it, it's the most insane evolution of what surround sound is because now mm. you're capable of having 128 different channels, not just seven or six. <sighs> and you know, you can send it everywhere around. I mean, it's spherical. It's everywhere around you, above you. It's, it's unbelievable. It's just, 
like being able to hear your own music like that. It's like nothing else. You know, you're actually existing within the music as opposed to purely being a listener. It's, it's amazing. What are the challenges though? Mixing, mixing in that. Honestly, I don't find any challenges in it. Really? Um, it's, it's just purely fun. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it, it doesn't make it any harder. It just gives you limitless options about how to spatialize your mixes. I mean, I would love to write in Atmos. That would be really exciting. The problem is I would need an Atmos studio and, uh, that's not in the budget. You know? <laughs> <laughs> uh, what else has been exciting you production wise recently? Cause I feel like you're on the forefront of this stuff, uh, more so than myself and other people. What's some stuff that just has been getting you excited? Honestly, it's nothing like cutting edge. I just like, I mean, I, I don't know. I'm not even really that up to date with, you know, whatever's new. I, I mean, I get, you know, like plugins that I'm on beta for, you know, I get new plugins, but. Well, it doesn't necessarily have to be new stuff, just maybe things you've rediscovered or, because I think we're, I think we're all about like getting the new producers, you know, oh, let's get the new plugin and so on and so on. But what you said about buying guitar pedals. Yeah. That honestly, like it's like pedals and like, I just bought a new, uh, a guitar cabinet for I have this old Mesa boogie like rectifier and back from you know my rock metal days and I've had like the amp head itself just sitting in my closet for god six years so I was just looking at it last week and I was like you know what you know I think I think it's time and it wasn't time to get rid of it no I just bought a cabinet instead so <laughs> that uh you know that that arrives tomorrow and then I get to have you know a real like a live guitar amp again because I've been using a uh a fractal audio axe effects for really six, seven years. Mm. And uh, so I'm excited to have that again. I just, I just like having real instruments, man. Yeah. It's as simple as that. I, what excites me the most is when I, when I've played something, whether, you know, like recently it was, you know, acoustic guitar and I tuning the acoustic guitar down to like a drop open a, so an octave below your fifth string on a guitar, so it's stupid low and just the way the strings rattle, you know, against the fretboard when you're recording and, you know, like and double tracking that and then having this super wide acoustic guitar that's really kind of like janky and almost lo-fi rattly sounding like that to me. Like I get so excited about that. It's just, yeah, for me, it's just, you know, experimenting and recording cool things and usually I mean, sometimes it's sound design based, but nothing in sound design makes me feel the same way a great chord progression or a great melody does. You know, that to me is, you know, what really touches me and all the other stuff is just ear candy. So do you have uh, a classical background? I mean, in terms of music theory training? Yeah. Mm. That help? Yeah. Yeah, of course. I mean, how could it not? You know, ever since I was a kid, I was having to learn how to read music, and I mean, a lot of a lot of people think it's a waste of time. I I definitely do not. But no, I, people who say that, I think that's just their reaction because they don't actually want to go through the labor of learning. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you know, it's like get over yourself, just do the work. <laughs> You'll be a better musician for it. You know, people want instant gratification. It's as simple as that. And yeah, it's daunting to know that you have to dedicate. God, I mean, a decade to even know what you're really doing. I I watched an interview with uh, Jacob Collier the other day. Have you heard of him? Uh uh-huh. No, who's that? Oh my goodness, man, he's a uh, he's a multi instrument instrumentist, instrumentalist, uh, instrumentalist. Yeah, so on. Yeah. And he's just he's a genius. He's like pretty young, um, but if you search him up on YouTube, he does like uh, a cappella videos, songs. But then he produces it himself. So he'll sing like, you know, seven part harmonies and then um, in the DAW, like just process each part differently. But I watched an interview with him and he just starts talking about negative harmony and like um, using G half sharp minor. And, and I'm just like, what? But I don't know, like being him and knowing that much or knowing that much about music theory, it must just completely change the way you listen to music and make music. I think it's really important. Yeah. It, I mean, there is that. Um, I certainly experienced that, especially after really like going through the pretty, well, just like 
regularly intense Berkeley thing where you just have to analyze everything all the time. And yeah, that's tough. You know, event for a bit, you know, you're definitely kind of kind of shaken by that where you can't really hear anything without analyzing it. But I think, um, I think my fair way to look at this and I actually, I remember this, like I read this from a interview with, uh, Ben, the guitarist from Dillinger escape plan, like God, 15 years ago. I mean, I was in high school and I read this, it was in like a guitar world magazine or something like that. And he said the thing with music theory for him was learn it all, like really learn it all and then forget it. And that's always been an ethos I've prescribed to because once you've learned it, once you've learned it, you it's internalized within you, you know, you'll never, you're not going to forget it, but the trick is not to think with it. I think that's where the limitation can come from. Right. As in you get too boxed in. Yeah, exactly. I mean, that that's, I mean, that's the things I always had really hard times with, like with a lot of like traditional harmony classes and things like that, where everything had to be parallel thirds and the way I had to write was basically mathematics. And I hate that. And I, I would, I got in fights with teachers because like, I know that is not the perfect note according to Bach, but my note sounds better, you know, and given like, that's me being like, you know, an arrogant kid, but like still in my mind, I truly believe that. I mean, still to this day, I would agree my note was better, but, um, yeah, I, I think, you know, it's important to learn it because then you understand it and knowledge of anything is important. You know, I, I I think it's silly to assume that you don't need it. And especially in a craft, which, I mean, there's a lot of, even beyond just the technical know-how, music is complicated. You know, it's not as simple as just, you know, sitting down with a guitar and playing some chords or at your laptop with Ableton and clicking in notes. Like, it's kind of funny. You lose, pers- or you lose perspective a lot because I don't, it's only when I'm talking to non-musicians, which is actually pretty rare for me these days because pretty much my entire social circle is musicians and it's always interesting when you have then someone else who isn't a musician in the room and they'll just look at you like you're talking a completely different language and you know because it's you know you're in your own bubble you don't realize that you know it is like it's complicated it is its own language so it's a yeah man it's a trip yeah, yeah, I like that. Okay, so two more things. You yeah. also uh, run a podcast too, which I just came across as I was researching and preparing for this. Tap Tempo. What made you start that? So towards the end of last year, I made some pretty significant changes in my professional life where um, I parted ways with my manager of five years. We were just going and, you know, I needed to do my own thing. Simple as that. And I didn't want anyone's permission to do it. Five years. That's, that's tough. <laughs> yeah, it was, yeah, it was, it was like a breakup, you know, that was like, it was hard. It was, it was really hard to sit in his office and, you know, just say like, this isn't working. I need to change. Yeah. It was really, it was like breaking up with somebody, but part of really like figuring out what I was going to do next aside from, aside from, you know, like creating the music I want to create, but I needed things to do. And I, I also, at the same time, I'd been dropped by my booking agency because they had just gotten bought out by a much bigger corporation. Mm. And the corporation looked at the numbers and it was basically, if you're not making a lot of money at festival shows, you're off. Hmm. And like, I don't play festivals really ever. I've actually done bizarrely two this year, but you know, they're smaller ones. It's not EDC. So I, I, I like clubs more anyway. I like the intimate. I just want a dark, smoky room with no lights like that's the total antithesis of what a festival is. So consequently, I didn't have a booking agent anymore. I no longer had a manager and I'm trying to figure out like, what the hell are some of the things I'm going to do? Like not only just to get by, but just also for my own sanity and, you know, to give me opportunities. And that's where, um, that's where tap tempo kind of, uh, the seeds of it were planted. So I was basically just, um, I was sitting at the bar down like down the street from my house with uh with my friend Anthony and he's a musician also he does a lot of trailer music and uh he he actually really is the one who got me into modular synths but we were talking and just having like the usual musician also friend like you know we're pretty emotional people so 
you know, but it was like an intimate conversation. That's also very, um, you know, music based. And I was just thinking like, you know what? It would actually be, it might be really interesting if we just had a microphone on while we were having talks like this. And that was, that was the idea. Mm -hmm. And then the first one I actually recorded was with Heather Bright and she came over to, she wanted me to play guitar on a record for her. And it was like, all right, but you got to, you have to be the first person to do my podcast. Yeah. Like that was the deal. And, um, and it was a lot of fun and it was totally silly and it was the first one. So I was, you know, pretty awkward about it and I didn't, you know, I didn't know what I was doing, but we did it anyway. And then the second one was supposed to be with Calix and TB and, then they totally surprised me. And the day of, like I, I, like, I texted T, like, you guys coming over? And he just wrote back, you know what? Uh, come meet us at this apartment. You know, we're, we're our friend John's place. We'll just do it here. It's really nice. And I'm like, oh, sure. And John's place was 12th Planet. And then Fotech was there also. And I picked up Matt Zoe on the way. So we suddenly had this very, like, impromptu round table. How have I and, not listened to this? Uh, it's the first episode that actually went out. I launched it's. <laughs> I launched with it. So, and yeah, you'll like, it's really tech heavy. Um, actually way more tech heavy than I anticipated and in general, more tech heavy than what I'd like to do in general. But I've always, the way I've liked the podcast to go is really, um, really like let the guest talk about what they want to talk about. And for some people, you know, it's especially like, okay, there's six music producers in a room yeah, we're just going to nerd out about gear. You know, that is, yeah. you know, like no one's gonna be like, how are your feelings today? No one gives a fuck. You know, we're about to like, <laughs> we're going to get really nitty gritty about production stuff because also I had, I had never met Fotech before. Uh, mm. I didn't think I'd ever really met 12th planet before. And so it was, and Matt didn't know Fotech and like, I've known Larry and T for years, but, um, and I've known Matt for a long time too, but they were the only people I really knew in that room. So Again, you know, there's a fair amount of like, you know, ice breaking that has to happen. And I mean, the common thread that bonds us all together is nerdy music stuff. So, yeah, that's that's really tech heavy. But um, yeah, that's just I've kept going. And uh, I mean, it's still very young. The 13th episode only went out yesterday, but it's uh, it's been good. It's. Certainly, I'm sure as you're aware, it's a lot more work than I anticipated. Is there anything you've learned from from doing it? I mean, I've I'm this is episode seventy, so I'm, I've learned a bunch, not just production stuff, but like a better idea of what artists deal with, and like there's not that much difference between everybody. You know, like we all have the same struggles, at like base struggles. It's interesting. Absolutely. So yeah, it's it's been a trip, but I've like it's great because you know I've actually. I've learned things about really close friends that I never knew. And that, you know, it, it's really amazing. And then of course I've, I've made new friends in the process also, but it's uh, so socially, it's been really healthy for me because it's easy for me to get, you know, lost in my box. But um, yeah, so this forces me to be social at least once a week if I'm not on the road, which is great. But uh, yeah, it's uh it's been a really interesting learning experience. And if people want to listen to that podcast, where can they go? Uh, well, if you're on iTunes, which is the preferred way, just search tap tempo, T A P T E M P O. And it's there, but then it also, it goes like, if you follow me on SoundCloud, it gets posted there. It goes to YouTube. Um, if you just Google, I mean, it, it goes out to everything, but iTunes is definitely the best way to do it because then when you subscribe, you get it automatically downloaded. Absolutely. Uh, Matt, I've got one more question for you. I ask this to almost every guest. You're, you're in LA, right? You're based in LA? Yeah. You're walking down the street and UFO comes along uh, and they're about to abduct you, these aliens, but they give you a piece of paper and a pen and they say you can write three pieces of advice for the world. What's on that piece of paper? Nobody owes you anything. Be kind. Be true. I love that. Matt, thanks heaps for coming on the show. This has been fantastic. Uh, if people want to learn more about you, follow your work, where can they do that? 
So my website is just uh, mattlang.net and that gets updated. Uh, it gets updated actually, yeah, weekly now because every time I do a podcast, I always end up writing a little blurb about whoever the person is and anything else I have going on in my world at that time. So that's probably the best launching point. And then from there, it'll link you to Twitter and Instagram and Facebook or, you know, all the all the junk. But um, really, the website is the best. And then, you know, there's a mailing list, too, if you want to subscribe and basically get those same letters just emailed to you as opposed to having to search for them. But uh, yeah. <laughs>